Hi, everyone. Dr. Tucker here, Doc T, with another episode of the Horses Advocate podcast. Thanks for joining us. Um, I'm having one of those days where nothing's really sticking in my brain. I'm not sure if you've ever had one of those, uh, but I know you have. And usually I can just pick a subject and just start talking about it. But today I'm kind of stuck. And one of the things I'm, I keep going back on uh, in my mind uh, just appeared again yesterday when I talked to a very knowledgeable person about anhydrosis or non-sweating in horses. And she has a practitioner who believes in uh, Chinese herbs and acupuncture as a treatment. And honestly, I don't have that much ex that much uh, experience with it. Um, I've tried it. I've seen it. <clears throat> sometimes it doesn't work. But I'm open minded because this gal is pretty pretty smart. She's been around for a while. So I just listened to what she had to say for horses that don't sweat anymore. And she came up with this one thought. Well, actually, she had a whole series of thoughts on it. And at the end, I said. Well, have you ever tried to figure out what the cause was? And they said, no. Or she said, no. And I'm like, does anybody know the cause of a horse not sweating? And she says, no. So then I said, well, we found out that when we take horses off of grain and only feed them forage, and even at that, maybe soaking the hay, these horses start sweating within three to four days. And her response was, well, of course, I take them off grain as well. And that got me to thinking, the philosophy that I've come up with, just being around horses forever, it seems like, is that we are constantly trying to add something. We're adding uh, some sort of supplement or a therapy, a treatment, to make things better. And my whole premise at the Horses Advocate is to start removing things that may be the cause. And so it was with this person when I asked her about the no, no, not feeding grain and her response was, well, of course we don't do the grain either. What was the actual result of this? Had she tried just taking the grain away and would there be that same result of the horse starting to sweat? Were the Chinese herbs or the acupuncture uh, helping this process? Were they actually making it work better? And there's no answer to this because she also pulled the horses off grain. So I find it fascinating that people are always, um, most people are always trying to find a treatment, a cure, uh, without saying, okay, hold on, what is the cause? Uh, this happens over and over again. Uh, for instance, in dentistry, in horses, there is a whole group of people that believe that you need to file the incisors, which are the front nipper teeth. You need to file them smoothly to align the mouth so that the bite is balanced and there's no more excessive pressure being placed on the temper mandibular joints. Those are the joints that where the lower jaw, the mandible, hooks onto the head and the joint is right next to the ear on both sides. And they are pretty adamant that the balancing has to occur. And I'm finding that none of the people will do any um, study that shows a certain number of horses where the incisor reductions are done and nothing else is done in the horse's mouth versus just the regular floating where nothing's done to the incisors or both and giving me a statistic statistically relevant uh, percentage of improvement based on the therapy that's being given. And of course, that would have to be done thousands of horses to get something relevant. And nobody's going to spend the time or the money to do a thousand horses one way, a thousand horses another way, a thousand horses third way. And again, it's 
everyone's trying to do something instead of stepping back and say, what's, what's happening? I had another person just ask me about their three-year-old horse that has lost uh, weight. And I'm going to put air quotes around that weight. Uh, but they were quick to say body fat in their horse. And since it went on the no grain diet and they're concerned because the horses that they're showing against have more body condition. And so look, they look better. And uh, that was their question to me. And I, the first thing I said to them was, well, how old is the horse? They said three years old. Well, that's huge because a three-year-old is so different than a gawky teenager who uh, goes into the fridge in the kitchen. Uh, their body fat uh, is relatively low. They have muscles, but their muscles are not like a, a, a man. This was a, a boy, actually. You know, they just don't look the same. They haven't developed that muscle mass yet. Um, and they wanted to know what to add. And it's not so much what to add in this horse is th than it is to actually identify what's going on. And that the lack of body fat is an indicator that the horse is actually uh, losing body inflammation. Um, so I asked a very common question, uh, how does the horse behave now that the, um, now that the grain is gone? And their immediate response was, oh my gosh, the horse did a 180 degree turnaround and it's now all so much improved that they are never going back to feeding grain. But now they have a eight, three-year-old who is losing body fat and they want to know what to do. In reality, the three-year-old is doing exactly what it's supposed to do, lose some body fat because the horse isn't being fed any uh, starch or any sugar. Um, so I asked, so what else are you feeding the horse? And they said, well, we're feeding about 35 pounds of alfalfa hay. Um, and the conversation kept going on and it took a while before they said, oh yes, we soak the hay. So the hay is now getting the sugar taken out of it. And so the horse is really on a very low sugar diet. It's like a keto diet and the horse is losing body fat. Well, gosh, don't we all want to lose our excess body fat? And so many of us go into a, ketos, a ketosis state or a keto type diet to transition over to fat burning. And that's exactly what this three-year-old was doing. So as you start digging down deeper into the cause, uh, you start to realize that there's nothing really more to add. It's just some adjustments. Um, we talked a little bit about hay, and I, I think maybe I've talked about this before in the podcasts that I've had, but it's worth going over again. Um, hay is an interesting subject. Hay is basically the cutting of grass, usually in the summertime, and it's stored in a bale to form, whether it's a small bale, a large bale, a giant bale, or a round bale. They're basically cut and then uh, dried and then packaged. And it was funny because talking to these people, uh, reminded me of so many of you who haven't been around horses very long. And some of you might've been around horses 30 years, but 30 years ago was 1990. I know time flies, 1991. And uh, what did we have in 1991? Well, we have uh, roads, we have interstate systems, we have tractor trailers, we have um, beautiful tractors, we have baling machines, we have fertilizers and cultivators and planters. We have all these things where we can really grow some super nice crops. We even have genetic modifications where we can adjust the crops and give them hybridized or hybrid vigor to create a stronger, more resistant uh, hay to uh, all sorts of things. So let's go back 40 years. Now it's uh, 1981. And uh, that's a different time. I'm just getting in vet school, but yet we still have hay, we have balers, we have tractors, we have interstates and everything. So now let's go back 50, no, let's go 60 years. So now we're back in 1961. In 1961, 
uh, is probably ancient history to a lot of you guys listening to this, uh, but it really isn't. 1961, we were just starting to build an interstate system. President Eisenhower had decided that we needed to move the military quickly from one side of the coast to the other in case we had an attack. We had just been coming out of World War II and the Korean War, and we wanted to defend our homeland a little bit better. So the interstate system was created to move uh, troops and equipment and supplies within the United States. And of course, the roads were there, uh, and they said, well, let's also put uh, travel of cars and trucks. An interstate commerce commission was created, and we have all sorts of um, commerce that are moves along these highways. But in 1960, 1959, that didn't exist. Uh, I-95 uh, here on the East Coast goes from Maine all the way down to Florida. But in 1973, when I was living in Florida, there was no I-95 from about Jacksonville or maybe Fort Pierce South. There was just no I-95. There were a lot of parallel two-lane and four-lane roads, US-1, US-A1A, as an example, paralleled it. But the interstate, you'd go on for a section, then you'd come off and you drive hours to go a few miles, then you go back on. That's how it was in 1973, which again is like 50 years ago. So <clears throat> these roads are relatively new. Now, if you go back to the uh, early 50s and the late 40s, <clears throat> we had just gotten out of World War II and we didn't have a lot of equipment available to the farmers. They were still out there plowing their fields and harvesting their grain using horses to draw the implements and lifting the hay that they cut or with a side cutter. They would lift it up with forks onto a wagon. We didn't have balers. I mean, some of the very rich and fancy farmers, they had some of this equipment. So let's go back to the uh, 1930s. How many people had these baling machines? Yes, they kind of existed, but they weren't very good. And the tractors are very underpowered. So, I mean, I'm, I'm still not even at 100 years ago of 1921, but there was very little farming being done and most horses didn't have access to hay. That's the thing I'm trying to get across to you. Hay is a relatively new man-made idea for our horses. And everyone goes out and buys hay and just, you know, feeds it to their horse, makes it available 24-7. But that isn't the way it used to be. Um, today, I was at a horse farm and I asked them some more questions because they are um, kind of a unique farm in the sense that they're a training facility for jumpers. They have about 25 horses in their barn at, at any one time. and they soak their hay in huge water tug tanks, tubs that are sitting on carts. And you can see these pictures when you look at um, the topics under um, horse care, uh, feeding hay, you'll see these uh, wagons pulling big tubs. And they soak their hay for approximately 12 hours. Yes, 12 hours to make sure all the sugar's out. And then they drain the water out and then they rinse the uh, hay one more time. And what they found was not only the horse is calmer because they're not feeding a lot of sugar, but when the hay is put in the stall, it doesn't attract flies and it doesn't become, uh, it doesn't start to stink or have that, you know, fermenting smell because all that sugar is gone, the dirt's gone, and the hay's basically been washed. So that is a really cool way of feeding hay. But again, 99.9% .9 of the farms I go to are constantly putting hay in front of the horse. And that's still not normal. That isn't the way a horse is supposed to be fed, especially during the winter. And I went over this with hormesis and trying to give a horse a break. So that was just another uh, example. Um, here's, here's another. Uh, and I saw this in the Horses Advocate Facebook group where they're talking about their horse is on the no grain challenge. 
and they're wondering why it's not working. Well, of course, they're feeding sugar beet pulp. That's not grain. And they're feeding a um, balancing type feed. And they say, well, that's not grain. And I'm like, yeah, but you're still adding all these supplements. For instance, they're adding minerals and vitamins um, and inflammatory ingredients still uh, without grain. So a lot of people just miss the whole point. They're still adding, thinking that they want to do the best thing for the horse, that something's missing in their diet. And so they add this, these uh, supplements to it. And the premise here at the Horse's Advocate is to take away and strip down the diet to what horses should be eating um, since, let's just pick a date, since 1900. Uh, around 1900, very few horses were fed uh, grain. Uh, they did have some grain bags, but those horses were working their tail off. And that brings up another point. Again, with this three-year-old, uh, he has no pasture. He has nothing but um, uh, forage. And they don't work that much. I mean, they work in a ring and they, you know, as a three-year-old, but they're not pulling cannons over mountains uh, to battles. You know, they're not dragging our sorry butts to, uh, to town every day. I keep telling people McDonald's food will not make you fat. It is the driving to and from McDonald's that makes you fat. In other words, we're sedentary beings and our horses are basically sedentary beings. They're not running from predators. They're not uh, on a continuous basis. They're not traveling you know, hundreds if not thousands of miles in their migratory routes. They are basically confined in an area. Yes, they'll run around. Yes, some of them will start sweating, you know, and puffing. And I get that. But the majority of horses just walk in and out of the paddock into your barn, and they're living sedentary life. And they found that in humans, 20-year-olds, and this is kind of crazy, but 20-year-olds at Yale University who are sedentary are already showing signs of insulin resistance because the um, sugar that they're feed, being fed is not being uh, utilized. So they, the, the muscle cells are starting to store uh, body fat inside the muscle cell, which is not where body fat should be stored. Um, and they're seeing this on their uh, biopsies long before any blood work changes where they have triglycerides or um, the triglycerides or the HDL, the high density lipoproteins are being um, uh, measured as a ratio, which is a sign of good health and bad health. Um, or I don't even wanna talk about LDL and it being a bad cholesterol because that is being phased out in so many people talking. But again, people keep trying to add things to uh, correct things. In reality, the, the machine called the horse has been correcting itself perfectly for hundreds of thousands of years. And it's only been a short while that humans have been there and a very short while where we start feeding them hay and all this grain. So it boils down to one more time, um, feeding a horse the way it was made to, the way it's evolved, uh, the way that its uh, equipment is set up for, with that lar large hindgut, uh, the colon, needing it, the bacteria back there to ferment the cellulose and letting the cellulose become uh, short chain fatty acids. And those fatty acids are what fuel the horse and keep going all year round. Um, I know a lot of people feed the balancers. Some of them feed um, just added vitamins and minerals. Um, I always ask the same question, who made these? Uh, who made the ingredients? Um, I know a lot of you don't understand this, but let's just take shampoo. Uh, if you are shampooing your hair, you have a shampoo that you prefer. And that shampoo is uh, you know, XYZ brand or ABC brand or whatever brand you want, and you like it. But what you don't understand is, Almost all of them are just basically using the same ingredients, just mixed together a little bit differently, and they slap a label on it. I know Melissa is making soap, and yes, yeah, she can make some beautiful bars of soap, but the ingredients used in the soap uh, can be varied a little bit, 
but it's basically the same. Those of you who make bread, um, you can have some nice sourdough bread, or you can have just a white loaf, a French baguette, or whatever you want, but it's basically the same ingredients kind of put together a little bit differently. <clears throat> and the supplements are basically the same thing. They go to a supplier and they buy, um, you know, several tons of, let's just say, vitamin A, and they get several tons of vitamin B1, thiamine, and several tons of selenium. And that selenium that you're buying uh, may have been manufactured in another country. It may have been shipped over here in a shipping container and set on the docks for uh, months, if not years, before it's actually put together into a mix that becomes your favorite supplement and you use it um, not knowing that the ingredients in that bag is exactly what they say it is on the label uh, because there's no oversight. And if there is oversight uh, and somebody is uh, third party testing the integrity of your uh, supplement, well, that's great, that's super. But um, I'm a big fan of believing that eating something that has been around for a long time, a plant, for instance, uh, is being made by the forces of the universe that have been there since the beginning of time. And we are pretty sure we know what's in there. And then I hear the argument, well, the soil's not the same. And I, I can't argue with that. Um, you know, we've overgrazed it. We've got our horses stuck behind a fence or a farmer who just keeps taking the same amount of land and plowing it, trying to get the most amount of plants out of that section. So they have got a, um, a hay that is not the same as it was 30 years ago, but nor is the seed that he uses because the seed has been genetically modified. And then he's added back minerals back to the ground to aid in its um, fertilization and its ability to grow the plant. But then the microbiome of the of the soil, and this is a this is a tough one for people to understand. But the microbiome inside of us is basically no different than the microbiome of the soil the plant's growing in. And if the microbes aren't right, the plant's not going to grow correctly or as healthily. So the farmer does its best job to make the plant as healthy as possible, but he's working, he or she is working against uh, so many factors, the genetic modification of the plant, and that could be either the gene splicing, or it could be the old fashioned genetic modification of, hey, let's uh, blend this type of grass with that type of grass, and we'll get a hybrid vigor that comes out. No different than um, a man meets a woman uh, from another country, and they decide to have a baby that's uh, creating all sorts of genetic modifications. So we have some that last a little bit better through the winter, uh, some that have more sugar. So the milk production from cows is increased. Um, there's all sorts of reasons that the grass is different than it was 100 years ago. And the soils are different than 100 years ago. But the water, most of the water has all these minerals and most of the vitamins are made by the horse's gut. So if the horse's gut is right, and you can tell because they're comfortable. They don't have squirts uh, coming down their hind legs, um, and they're not uh, switching their tail or you know feeling girthy. These horses are pretty much a lot more comfortable in their gut than other horses showing signs uh, such as stomping his feet or improper behavior under saddle or just a sour attitude. So we get that gut right by just feeding the foods that it's supposed to be eating. And the vitamins and minerals, I think, come along. Uh, and and the, my premise to that is uh, I've, I don't see too many horses that have vitamins or mineral deficiency. Um, now, I know that it occurs. I know, especially in horses that are um, starving, you know, starvation cases, that's true. But that's just a no-brainer. Uh, but horses that are kept out on pretty much pasture or eating most of the haze that we got, we don't see that. The biggest thing that we see is the chronic protein deficiency. And we've beaten that chronic protein deficiency causes into the ground uh, with my podcasts and my other uh, materials that you can read. So 
I don't want to go there. The point I'm still trying to make is we constantly are going out trying to find something to fix things, whether it's a vaccine to prevent a disease or um, uh, treatment of massage therapy or uh, acupuncture or chiropractic or um, shockwave or all these things. But what would happen if we could swing the time back uh, towards the beginning of the horse's life and say, okay, what would happen if we start to put this together in a different way? Um, it reminds me of a magazine that is trying to get itself uh, feet on the ground, uh, where it's going to discuss a lot of things about uh, horses' hooves, uh, farriery. Uh, and veterinarians, veterinarians' uh, connection with farriers to create a really healthy foot. Um, and my biggest complaint is that whenever I talk to a farrier or a veterinarian about the hoof, um, I just sit and listen, and I listen to all the stuff that they talk about. And then I finally say, well, why aren't you talking about feeding the hoof properly? And I oftentimes just get a blank stare, and I say, well, what's the hoof made out of? And they'll start to hem and haw and start to spit out some stuff. And I say, well, it's basically protein. So why aren't you feeding the horse the protein it needs to create the hoof? And they're saying, oh, no, no, it's because it's been shot. You can't put shoes on the feet. Or they'll say the angles are wrong. Or they'll say, well, the horse has laminitis. Uh, so it's diseased. Um, and they'll go on like this. And I'm like, but who's talking about feeding the horse's hoof correctly? And it still boils down to the same thing. So the premise, once again, is let's find the baseline and get the horse to the baseline of health, which doesn't mean we're going backwards. We're actually climbing trying to clear away all the inflammatory ingredients, all the nonsensical stuff, meaning the stuff that we can't guarantee that's what's in the bag it is, is good for your horse. Uh, remember my blog uh, called Betrayal that talked about lignin sulfonate uh, being put into the um, uh, balancers and lignin sulfonate, if you don't remember, uh, I had to look it up. And the number one use of lignin sulfonate is for dust control on dirt roads, uh, followed by uh, making a slurry for uh, well drillers into the earth, uh, also creating concrete and sheetrock, uh, also a precursor to DMSO. And finally, fifth on the list was a um, uh, antioxidant for fire extinguishers and animal feed. And that's what they're putting into our uh, balancers for our horses for, you know, because we as horse owners want to do the best. We are constantly uh, telling ourselves um, that we're responsible for their health. And that seems to be an active role that we want to take on. We want to get in there and fix things we want to prevent things from occurring. And we think that we can do that by purchasing supplements or uh, special grains because my horse has become a senior um, or things like that. And um, in reality, most of these things are causing inflammation of the horse, but nobody's helped you understand that. All you've got are your mentors who have been feeding horses for the past 30 years, but who taught them and who taught those mentors? And you have to go back into the 50s, the, the 60s, the 50s, the 40s, say, okay, how do we do this? And of course, everyone says, well, they had much more pasture uh, and now we can't afford pasture. So, okay, so we've had to adapt the way we keep our horses. And of course, that makes everything kind of... Uh, Unnatural, I think would be the best way to say it. In other words, putting a fence up and shrinking that and then adding more horses than there should be on a pasture, you're stressing them, you're adding uh, a dense population, and uh, then you take them away 
off on a truck that flies down the road at 80 miles an hour, you know, sometimes hitting the brakes and sliding sideways uh, to a horse show where they meet all these strange horses and they're, they're stressed even more uh, with viruses and bacteria and parasites that they pick up these shows. And then they come back and um, not every horse enjoys this. And we, we say, well, too bad. I've invested so much money in you. And by the way, I love you. So I'm going to do what I can to make sure that you remain disease free. So I'm going to add all these supplements. I've got a joint supplement for you. I've got these vitamins and minerals that are going to make you feel so much better. And I got this really good quality hay. And here's this uh, special brand of food that has been specifically selected and manufactured for your stage of life. And we think we're doing well. But in reality, the gut microbes are saying, all I want is forage. I want ground plants. I'd like to have them uh, when it's in abundance in a small field. And if that's not available, I'll take last summer's grass. But we also want to slow down during the winter. And I really would like to lose all this inflammatory body fat. And I'm not worried about my neighbor saying, my horse is looking skinny, when in reality, the body condition scores is still a six, you know? It's come down from a nine, he's gone to a six, and we're starting to see ribs and a, and a, a, a backbone, and, and we're discovering that all the muscle has been lost because you've been doing this year after year after year, and we start to feel guilt. Most of the horse owners today, uh, if you're not working them, if you're uh, not professionals, uh, you start thinking about uh, you being the caregiver for this uh, beast that you've decided to feel responsible for. And when that happens, um, you start to feel guilty. And some of us have a lot of extra money in our pockets. And so we think that it's okay to buy a 20 pound bag of carrots or a bushel basket of apples or have a, a candy and, and sugar cubes that are hanging out because we can buy them versus the other group of us that are trying to rub two nickels together just to pay the bills, uh, we're still going to spend whatever we've got extra uh, on these supplements for our horses because we don't understand that almost everything that's been taught to you, if you've been with horses for 30 years or less, has been skewed. And you have to go back 40 or 50 years to understand that they survive just fine in their hind gut fermenting way of putting in forage in their, in their stomachs and in their hind gut, where they develop this short chain fatty acids and they live perfectly good lives. Unfortunately, even though I've been around horses for just about 50 years, it'll be uh, 50 years in 1970, uh, 19, in 2023, I started in 1973. Um, back then, we still started to have horses with um, some of these problems. But I also remember that we had a railroad car filled with oats in 96 pound bags of oats that we would carry off the box car and put into a pickup truck and drive it off to the farm. Um, 96 pounds because there's three bushels and we bought 32 pound per bushel bags. So that's why they're called 96 uh, pound bags. And they're pretty heavy. Uh, picking up a 96 pound sack of, of oats uh, and hauling it and putting it in the truck and then coming back and pick out another one. Uh, it's not like you guys going out and buying a 50 pound, pound of uh, a bag of feed. It's 96 pounds, it's almost double the weight. But that's how they came. There was no 50 pound bags. Um, it was just oats. And we also had tractor trail loads of hay that came in. And our horses were being fed a lot of excess uh, sugar. And yet, my um, the owner of the farm that I was working for, she had plenty of money and she was able to get these to come in, these these semis and these railroad car filled with food and to feed her hundred horses or so that were on the farm. Uh, was it the right thing to do? Looking back, I was, I'm thinking, no, maybe not. So 
it all boils down to this. The horse has been around for, well, it's debatable. Is it 55 million years or is it, you know, several hundred thousand years? You know, if they've changed forms, obviously. But the point is, most horses have been uh, used by man for no more than 4,000 years. I saw a reference the other day that said 5,000 years. So fine, I'll give you 5,000 years. Let's do that. And between when we started to about less than 100 years ago, these horses basically grazed and were fed what they could be fed, but there was no hay, there was no grain. They were, had this winter time where they lost their uh, fat. Uh, maybe they were migrated and moved to a Southern uh, climate during winter and then in the spring and summer were brought back up North, but that's fine but they didn't have all these problems. All the problems that were not in the textbooks in the 1980s that we see now, uh, everything, everyone horse, horse has, seems to have Cushing's, everyone's talking about Cushing's, and then they talk about insulin resistance, and then they don't understand the difference between the two, so they just say, yeah, my horse has Cushing's and insulin resistance, like, yeah, doesn't yours? Uh, or they have kissing spine, a disease we didn't have, drop fetlocks that we didn't have. Um, we have skin conditions in our horses. We have increased amount of equine asthma out there, which we used to call COPD or heaves. Uh, thrush, uh, white line disease, cracked hooves, splayed hooves, just the fairs going nuts out there, just trying to fix all these hooves and make them healthy again in, a, in an unhealthy hoof. So uh, it's almost like a losing battle. So owners go through farriers like, you know, Every year, it's going to be somebody new out there because the first uh, farrier wasn't able to do what he said he could do, he or she. Um, so that's my ramblings for today. Um, it's been a little bit disjointed, and I apologize for that. But I just want to take a break and come back to what our basic tenet is based on what I've seen, what I hear at farms, what I uh, read on the Facebook uh, user group. and it's just the same thing over and over and over again. Doc, I want to do the best for my horse. And I say to them, well, gee, how's what you're doing working for you? And if you just ask that question, if it comes up short and you say, well, it's not working well at all, uh, then you have to understand that what you're doing may not be the best thing for your horse. So that contradicts your desire to do the best thing for your horse. And yet you're seeing with your eyes, it's not working. And yet nobody's coming forward and saying, well, have you tried something different? You know, the old expression Einstein says, I assume Einstein, I don't know, maybe, maybe this isn't true, but they said the sign of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. And if your horses aren't thriving, then what you're doing isn't working. And adding and adding and adding more supplements or uh, techniques or therapies isn't going to help them. You have to create a horse that's healthy on the inside. And from that point, you can move forward and start to give them something that uh, can build their structures and keep them healthy and give them that health span that we all look for, not just lifespan. They still can die prematurely. We understand that. But I want the horse to um, go on its last day uh, feeling good and happy. And that's what we try to do here by helping horses thrive in the human world at the Horses Advocate. And um, hopefully I haven't wasted your time on this. Maybe it's a refresher for many of you. Maybe it's the first time you've heard me say these things. But uh, there, I'll probably end up doing it three or four times a year just to remind people, how's what you're doing working for you? And that might be the title of this podcast, uh, just for you to reflect back on how rapidly we've changed the way we feed horses relative to how many uh, years they've been on this planet and it may not be working out the best way. And all the people, I mean, there are exceptions because there's so many individuals, but the vast majority, certainly 80% and going up to 90% of the people who try to take all things away from the horse other than ground plants and closely monitor the pasture and the haze that they get and replace their lost protein with a high quality protein, 
almost without exception, these horses are doing 180s in their behavior and making them happier. And they're also uh, becoming healthier and uh, getting off medications and uh, running around the field uh, more like their younger self. So try it. What does it cost you? Not much. It's basically the no grain challenge. You can read that at the horse's advocate and see what it's all about and uh, take the dive. The worst thing that can happen is the horse loses a, a bunch of fat and uh, that freaks you out. It, but instead of just going back to what you're doing before, step back and look at your horse. Is it uh, happier? Is it thriving? Is it recovering faster from whatever uh, sport you're in? Um, does it seem like everything's going right? And the only thing is that they're losing body fat. Well, maybe it's time you change your paradigm uh, from, oh my gosh, he's losing weight. I must be a bad caretaker to, gosh, he's losing body fat. And now I know he's less inflamed. So he must be feeling better and healthier. And that's what I'd like you to focus on here. So that's it, Doc T. Um, relatively short one. I don't even know how long this one was. Um, but I hopefully I'll be back on track with a, a good thing. I know um, in the next, uh, let's see, couple of months, I've got some really cool seminars that I'm going to be attending. But of course, in December, I've got the huge AAEP meeting, uh, the annual meeting where they're going to have dozens of different things that I'm going to attend. And I'll report back to you on that. But in the meantime, I'm going to let you go. Thanks for listening. Again, I appreciate every one of you. Uh, please leave a review on your favorite podcast um, uh, media that you're using, whether it's Apple or Google or uh, Amazon or Stitcher or Spotify. Just go in there and leave a, a five-star review. Tell people what you think about it and turn other people on to this. This is how we're going to help horses thrive in a human world together. All right. Doc T saying uh, thanks for stopping by. Hey everyone, Doc T here. Thank you for listening to my content. Would you do me a huge favor? Would you please subscribe, comment, like, thumbs up, and give a star review? However it's presented to you, I want you to do that. There are two reasons. The first, of course, is to improve this product. This way I know what you like, what you don't like, what I can improve upon, what topics you want me to cover. But more importantly, it's also going to help others find me. And by doing that, you are now engaged in this mission of helping horses thrive in a human world. By you helping, we can reach others. And that I would be so grateful for. And remember, go to thehorsesadvocate.com for updates on this information. Thehorsesadvocate.com. And again, thank you so much for being here. Doc T out.